Hello, welcome to the first video of the Mastering the Nerves course, or certainly the first session where we'll discuss the anxious mind. And I guess this video is laying the groundwork or the foundations, if you like, for what, what's to come. Um, and I think what, what I know what, what we'll go on to do here is we'll look at how our minds have evolved um, and how that evolution maybe plays out in our day-to-day -day life, certainly in our performance context, whatever that may well be. And also we'll take a little bit of time to do an experiment, I suppose, to look at how we think, like like how that actually operates inside our minds, inside our heads. Um, but before we go into all of that sort of stuff, what I'm going to do is introduce you uh, to some clients at the start of each session. Um, totally anonymize the client's data and information so that they can't be identified, but sharing the stories nonetheless to try and portray, I guess, some of the themes that will inform the session itself. Um, so let's get cracking. So let's begin then by hearing, I guess, about Scott's story. Scott was a 25-year-old professional footballer who prided himself on his cool head and ability to perform in the big moments in those big games. And he was the team's main penalty taker and that kind of fitted with his persona and his role within the squad and he certainly relished that sort of prestige I, get, I guess. Um, until of course the inevitable happened. Twice. Scott missed two consecutive penalties one month apart from each other and one was in a league game and then I was in the cup and, and while Scott felt neither miss could be solely attributed to the team losing the respective game, the, the prospect of taking another game, or sorry, of taking another penalty was beginning to fester in his mind. The self-doubt and associated nerves around possible future penalties meant he increasingly thought about them. Doubts surfaced in the days and weeks following that second miss, whispering things like can you actually do it again? How do, how do you know you'll not miss again? Imagine if you did. Imagine what would happen then. Maybe you have had thoughts similar, you, the listener. Ironically for Scott, it felt like the more he tried to ignore all of these thoughts and worries and concerns and ignore these feelings of nerves and anxiety, the stronger it all got, and the stronger it got, the more he didn't want to take penalties in training and in the matches. He, he avoided what he used to be good at or used to enjoy or relish. So he felt stuck and increasingly anxious. You see, Scott, like anyone watching this video, has a, has a brain that has evolved over, I don't know, I mean, half a billion years or so, roughly, give or take a year. Uh, and in that time, the brain has frankly had to adapt in order to keep us alive. It has to create, I suppose, shortcuts or preferences in order to help us or help it be as efficient as possible. I mean, back in the day, the, the very, very distant day, the person who overreacts to a rogue stick on the ground, thinking it's a snake, We'll live to see another day, laugh about it with the tribe in the evening, and so on. The person who simply didn't notice a stick, and probably not the actual snake further down the path, well, they probably exited the gene pool pretty swiftly. So our brains, I suppose, have adapted to frankly keep us alive. And from those humblest of beginnings, we began to develop some more preferences. For example, we're, we're social creatures. I, I mean, you may not be preferring instead to be holed up in a dark corner of your house somewhere, but as a species, I don't think there can be any denying the value of groups, teams or communities for our own survival and development. In fact, we also want to be in with our group. We don't want to be castigated or seen as an outsider. I mean, it's so primitive, but anyone who's experienced FOMO, that is fear of missing out, or shares a house with a teenager knows exactly the power behind being in with the group. After all, that's evolution coming through and trying to propel you to make sure you're not missing out and to be part of the, the group's experience. And I guess we also want to be like them by our group or tribe. They protect us, after all. They give us a sense of belonging, a sense of connection. And when the so-called baddies come running round the corner, 
if we've invested enough into the group, we can be confident someone's got our back. And again, our, our minds are so sensitive to any of these threats. Like even in today's world, they, you know, you watch a horror movie, and after you watch that, you maybe overreact to the slightest sounds in the house because your mind or brain is telling you or making on the assumption that the baddie has somehow, if the millions of houses in the country found yours exactly after you've watched that movie. Now, of course, you don't want to act out as if you are on the run from a maniac killer. But nonetheless, being sensitive to risk at a species or evolutionary level seems to work well. And I guess the key here to understand or take away is that these processes or, as I said, preferences or dispositions of our brains are exactly what we then take into our performance arena. A sensitivity towards being seen as rubbish, being judged, being criticised, making a fool of ourselves um, and not succeeding and maybe not making the expectations we have for ourselves and for the others have of us all feed into our anxiety in the sporting arena. All because our brains, our minds just want to keep us safe to be part of the group and to therefore be sensitive to any possible threats to that homeostasis. I read once actually that our minds and its ancient ways are like a cave person falling asleep at the campfire and then waking up in the middle of Times Square. The world has changed drastically, but the hardware, that is our minds if you like, haven't. There are no saber-toothed tigers floating about in the bushes, certainly no deadly snakes if you live in the UK, and we don't really need to go hunting to survive, but what there is is, as I've said, judgement from others, the possibility of losing our place or respect within our tribe, inevitable failures, mistakes and setbacks, and threats that come in different shapes, sizes and guises that are as diverse as we are people, I suppose. So our mind, with its love for planning and analysing, predicting the future, judging things, judging people, judging ourselves, um, and everything in between, they're all features of a mind that has developed to keep us alive, keep us safe, to help us be part of our group, our tribe. But I think there's something here that we need to notice about our ancient mind. And with that, I want to invite you to try a simple experiment. And I want to invite you to practice an attention exercise, which means you're going to need to pay attention. So we're going to sit for two minutes in silence, like actual silence. I'm not going to say anything and you might actually then want to find somewhere you can do this without being disturbed and all we're going to do is pay attention to our minds during those two minutes it's as simple as that we're, we're literally just going to watch or listen to whatever it is that our mind does in those two minutes um we're not trying to stop thinking at all and um, we're not trying to make our mind go blank we're not trying to make ourselves think positive we are um not trying to relax i'm not trying to turn you into some sort of like buddha um if you want to shave your head on the back of this and wear an orange, orange toga and run about your street like that that's up to you man that's your choice but i'm not trying to do that we're genuinely not trying to do anything but just pay attention to what goes on inside our head no trickery nothing fancy it's honestly as mundane as it sounds just pay attention for two minutes to what happens in your head. Let's do it. Two minutes of silence. You can close your eyes if you want to. You can look at the floor, stare at something on the wall or in the distance a little bit. All you need to do, as I said, is just pay attention to what your mind does. Starting for two minutes. Starting now.
And again, all we're doing is just watching our mind. Watching what it does, what it's up to, what we're thinking, where's it going? And that is a one minute up. That's maybe feeling like a lifetime. Okay, that's two minutes. Now, let me make an assumption here. And if you're anything like me, your mind was probably pretty busy. Minds was judging whether or not this is making any sense to you. It was wondering if you'll even be doing it. It was playing out scenarios, imagining that you've closed down your browser tab, jumped into your emails, your demanding a refund or wanting to complain about something in some way um, and it totally changed gear and started wondering where I'll, where I'll take the dog for a walk later on today you, you may have actually been doing that too, too. Not, not thinking about where you're going to take my dog for a walk but maybe you were judging the content here, wondering what it's got to do with nerves or maybe judging uh, yourself, either how great you are at paying attention or perhaps more likely um, berating yourself for how poorly you are at paying attention or maybe it was just all over the place like thinking about what you did earlier today what you'll do later what you'll say and so on um, our minds are pretty busy and I guess we can maybe call that part of ourselves our thinking self that's the part of us that just thinks like always it's always thinking, analysing, evaluating things, predicting, assuming, planning, problem solving. All things our minds do, like, automatically. I mean, it just does it sometimes. I mean, sometimes it's helpful as well, but sometimes it's, it's not. But I guess for this point, all we need to understand is, yeah, there's this part of ourselves that thinks. We're calling it our thinking selves. And now brace yourself. We're going to do it again. We're going to go though for one minute rather than two minutes and again the task is simply just to watch your mind you're not trying to change your thoughts you're not trying to think positively you're not trying to stop thinking you're not trying to relax none of that you're just watching what is going on in your head so same again you can close your eyes stare at the floor stare off at the distance whatever suits you we're going to focus on our minds for one minute Starting now. And your mind might be quite busy just now, um, doing what it does. Just keep paying attention to it. But notice that it's doing whatever it's doing without you making it do anything, without, if you like, any sense of you being at the control panel and generating all these thoughts, it kind of just does it, thoughts kind of bubble up. It's just going. And see if you can notice that there's there for your mind, thinking, doing its thing, but then there's you watching it. You don't need to overthink that bit. Just notice, there's your mind thinking 
And then there's this part of you that's just able to watch it, to notice it, almost to, if you like, take a step back from it, to put a step away from it and just watch this thinking self going on its roller coaster. And that's a minute. In fact, it's more than a minute. I'm lying to you there, but time does fly by when you're, by when you're having fun, doesn't it? Um, so that may have been a bit weirder. Yeah, there's that thinking self, our mind that's just thinking, running around, trying to plan, predict, judge, and all these things. Um, all these things that minds do. Um, but there's this other part, the part from which you can observe your mind. So I guess you don't just have this thinking self, you also have this, what you might call, observing self too. And I mean, don't take my word for that. I mean, it's a matter of your own experience. You can experience the different perspectives. If, and if you don't believe me, just rewind the video and try that exercise again. You, you will notice it. It is there. After all, who is noticing the thoughts? It has to be this other part of you that's there. So here's a question, though. When you're feeling anxious in your whatever performance arena, whatever that context is, which one of these two selves, this thinking self or observing self, which one of those is running the show, do you think? I mean, the answer's got to be it's the thinking self with all its judgment, prediction, analysing, problem solving, and so on. And it's the observing self, of course, well, think of it this way. Which one's running the show, if you like, in those times when you're totally in the zone? Totally absorbed and focused and tuned into whatever it is you're doing when time flies by or just slows down, things kind of feel effortless. There's probably not much thinking going on. So here's a question. I wonder what differences it would make if we were able to stand in that observing self a little bit more, if you like, if we were able to get ourselves into that position a bit more often. What differences might that make in our respective performance domain? But I wonder also what differences that may make in our broader life. But perhaps the most crucial thing here is to understand that you are not your mind. Certainly not the part of ourselves that people think is their mind, that thinking self. I mean, it's just doing its own thing. I mean, it runs by its own rules laid down through evolution and, of course, influenced by our own individual upbringing and learning. Now, sometimes that thinking self helps. You know, those of us that have to do tax returns, that thinking self that's analysing and judging and evaluating, that's pretty helpful uh, when it does that. But again... The focus here is in performance domains, whatever that is for you. And when we're doing a lot of thinking about things, does it help? I can't answer that for you. My hunch is that it sometimes gets in the way. And if you're still clinging to the belief that well, you are your mind, consider this. You. The person listening to this video don't even know what the next thought will be in your own mind. Such is the relative unpredictability of your thinking self. You do not know what the next thought will be in your mind. So what if we could, as I said earlier, develop that ability that psychological muscle to stand in that observing self mode a bit more often. I wonder what differences that would make to help us master our nerves and perform our best. And I guess that's what we're going to be spending a lot of our time on the course exploring, helping us try and develop those muscles to help move us into that observing self mode a little bit more often. So I guess in summary we've got this ancient brain that's developed in order to keep us alive and in doing that is, is developed to get shortcuts and preferences that are ancient but we still 
carry with us today. Yeah, it's the hardware that we've inherited, but we have to then take with us into the performance context, whatever that looks like for us. And when we start delving into looking at how our, I guess, our mind works, we can notice that there's a thinking self, a part of us that's analysing and judging and evaluating and doing all these things that minds do, but there's also this part of us that can watch and notice. Um, and I think where we're going, or I know where we're going with this course, is to really emphasise um, the benefits of being in that observing self and particularly how can we develop the psychological muscle, if you like, to help us get into that space a little bit more often. Because after all, you are not your mind. You, you don't even know what your next thought will be. So I look forward to seeing you in video two. With video two, we will look at all the things your mind has came up with in order to try and help you manage nerves previously.